Welcome everybody. My name is Cameron Rhodes and this is the Guided Trip Fly Fishing Podcast. The intro music was provided by local musicians here in Gunnison, Colorado, Sam Pankratz and Jenny Hill. They're pretty badass. Check them out. Um, put on a pretty good bluegrass show. So definitely want to thank them for that and we'll be able to hear the rest of the clip at the end of the show here. So the Guided Trip is an uncensored fly fishing podcast aimed towards the never ever fly fisherman all the way up to what I call the I've been everywhere man type of fly fisherman. Uh, seeing this our first podcast ever, I'll introduce myself just a little bit more. Uh, I'm a fly fishing guide in Gunnison, Colorado. And for those of you to, who don't know where Gunnison is, it is located about four hours west of Denver. I've lived in the valley for going on nine years now, and I've been guiding for about seven years in the valley. I grew up on the front range of Colorado. And I was pretty fortunate enough to be able to fish around the Front Range and into the western slope a little bit of Colorado. Um, you know, I fished the Eagle a lot. I fished the Colorado. I fished the Blue. Um, I fished all throughout South Park, you know, into Tomahawk. I'm sure you, some of you guys know where that is. Um, and, you know, I was pretty fortunate enough to travel a little bit when I was a kid as well. My dad, my sister, and I used to build drift boats for a couple years and I got to travel into New Mexico, go float to San Juan. I was even fortunate enough to go into Wyoming and float Gray Reef a fair amount when I was a kid. And we even did pump house down on the Colorado, you know. So we would do that float on the weekends uh, because it was close to town. And we could make it up there and do make a day trip out of it. Um, you know, since then, uh, I've traveled a fair amount, you know, not not as much as I'd like to, of course, but I've made my way into Montana. Uh, last spring, got to float the Smith River in Montana, which is an excellent stretch of river. It's the only permitted section of river in Montana, um, and that is a lottery trip. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I, I urge everybody to, you know, support the Smith, try and get in on that program, what they're doing with it right now. And like I said, we'll get into it a little bit more on some different podcasts, but I was pretty lucky to be able to go do that. Um, I went to Michigan for a week or so uh, a couple years ago and chased Steelhead over Thanksgiving. That was a very interesting experience. You know, I went with a buddy out there and he grew up out there and we got there and as we got there, it's, it was raining terribly. Um, I mean, almost this freezing rain. And I think they got almost 19 inches of rain by the time we made it from Colorado to Michigan driving. Um, and the rivers were just completely blown out. I, it was one of the toughest fishing experiences I think I'll ever have, um, uh, to date at least. Um, definitely plan on going back and trying to fish, find at least, a, you know, one steelhead. We didn't even see one. We didn't get to catch one. We, uh, we fished our hearts out, but it was, it was definitely one of the, the toughest times I've had on the river. Um, and you know, that's just the way it goes. So can't say too much about that. Um, but it definitely will keep me coming back. I also got to experience my first saltwater fishing, um, fly fishing experience where I got to go to the Bahamas in November and go chase bonefish. And it was an excellent trip. Um, I, I couldn't ask for more, you know, we were out there for five days. We had three, there, I'd say maybe two and a half good days of fishing, but again, that's the way it goes, you know, weather prevailing and you, you take that chance and you go for it. But for my first saltwater experience, it, it was an amazing time and I got to catch my first bonefish and see some really cool sights and different wildlife I've never seen before in my life. So that will also be a trip, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be going on again at some point or at least somewhere else to try and chase bonefish or tarpon or permit or something. Um, I'm addicted now to the salt water and I know for me, it was a super humbling experience. Um, I mean, you get, you get your ass kicked out there, especially if you're, you've never saltwater fished in your life and you know, you get this nine weight, 10 weight in your hand and you're casting into the wind, your guide's going, Oh, here they come, you know, try and make that 70 foot cast into the wind. You're going, oh, dude, there's no way. Um, so it's very humbling. Um, but you, you do pick it up. And all it is is practice. Uh, I, you know, a good buddy of mine, Ryan McVeigh, um, his he had a pretty good saying about it. Or his, mm -hmm. his uncle had a pretty good saying that 
because you know uncle mike what what's it take to be to be a good flats fisherman and he goes oh about half a million dollars which is completely true um i mean it, it it's those trips aren't cheap and you know if you want to get good at it you got to go a lot um and that's that's the only way it's going to work is just practice and you can practice in the lawn you can practice at the lakes with your nine weight or you know wherever and and cast and i i do that a fair amount but you know it never really prepares you for when you get there and you know the your adrenaline's going and these fish are coming and you're trying to put it right on the money and you know you, you blow a lot of casts um and that you know your guide ne- doesn't necessarily think too much um of you at that point but you're doing your best you're doing it all you can really so i've been pretty lucky to be able to travel around to some places like i said uh earlier obviously i haven't traveled to everywhere i want to and i'm not the type that you know gets to be able to do that um you know i work all summer guiding and then i i i'm lucky if i get to plan a trip or two um i also work a couple different jobs just trying to get by and make it ends meet so um, of course I'm going to travel more in the future and I plan on it and we will talk a little bit more of that, about that, you know, maybe some cool trips that I'm planning or some bucket list trips. Um, and I definitely have a couple trips coming up this spring that we're planning just, just around the States here, um, you know, into Wyoming, maybe even go float the Juan again here shortly. Um, but so growing up pretty lucky to travel, even in my adult age now, pretty lucky to travel. So I want to jump in to why the podcast Uh, a couple weeks ago maybe even a month ago now I was sitting down with my old man having a beer and hanging out and bullshitting and you know as everybody knows you start to drink a couple more beers and you start to bullshit talk a little bit more and we were talking fly fishing talking different things tips tactics whatever you know just kind of cool things we'd learned and I, I told him I you know I felt like I needed to channel some of this information that I had um, not to say I have all the information, but I, I wanted to start a blog and, you know, he suggested I start a podcast and I, you know, going back and forth, I just kept telling him, I go, you know, I've been talking to my girlfriend nonstop, you know, about fly fishing. I talked to my friends nonstop about fly fishing and, you know, I, I might not have had the right audience. And so I want to find that right audience, and that's why I'm starting this podcast. I want to put some of this information out there, and hopefully it'll help people. Hopefully it'll entertain people and get the word out a little bit, and we'll see what happens with it. Um, you know, the the whole aspect is there's only so much you can, you know, talk fly fishing with your girlfriend before she tells you to shut the hell up and go to sleep, and I get that. And so I'm, I'm looking for that audience here. So with that, we can talk about the structure of the podcast and what we aim to discuss. Um, Because this podcast is Colorado-based, we will be talking a lot about Colorado. um, And we will be doing a guide report around Colorado, and we will be calling different shops and talking to other guides and and seeing, you know, what's hot and what's not and where to fish and where you guys would like to fish. Of course, we're not going to tell you everything that we know. Uh, You're still going to have to pay for a guided trip if you want to learn all the secrets of the trade. Um, but during the podcast, we are going to talk, talk about tips and tactics, rigging, fly tying, fly selection. We'll be talking about controversies, you know, public land versus private land, uh, water rights. We're definitely going to be talking about walkway versus float fishing. Um, and on that note as well, we're going to talk about dories versus rafts. Um, and if you don't know what a dory is, a dory is a drift boat. Um, I'll tell you one thing I don't talk about and you will probably never hear me talk about is Tinkara. That's not really fly fishing, uh, so we're going to stay away from that topic. I will also be setting up an email so listeners can email in with different top- topics that they would like discussed or they want to hear about or you know, even just get my opinion about those things, and I'll let you know when that email is set up. So let's talk about Gunnison and the Gunnison River first before we get into the fishing aspect of it. Um, the Gunnison River... Um, is created by the East and the Taylor River. And that confluence is at Almont, Colorado, which is about 10 miles north of Gunnison. And East is a great fishery. East is pretty much all, you know, mountain fed, um, runoff water. And Roaring Judy uh, Fish Hatchery, which is our largest, I think it's one of the largest fish hatcheries in the state, um, is actually right there on the East River. And then the Taylor River 
um, that comes out of Taylor Dam and Taylor Reservoir, which is all snow melt as well. But most people know the Taylor River for the catch and release section of, of the Taylor, which is just a quarter mile of public catch and release only, flies and lures only section of water right at the dam of, of Taylor Reservoir. Um, and, you know, people call it the hog trough. They have lots of different names for it. But there are some monster fish up there. And we will talk about the Taylor catch and release a little bit. I call it the CNR. Um, so you will hear me mention the CNR quite a bit. But we'll talk about that here in just a moment. So east in the Taylor, make the Gunnison. The confluence is at Almont. Um, and the Gunnison is actually a tributary of the Colorado River. And they meet together. The Gunnison meets the Colorado in Grand Junction. So there's about 164 miles of Gunnison River. Here in town where we fish, we have about, I'd say, close to 30 miles of floatable water, um, just minutes from town. And then obviously, you know, fishable water is different from floatable water. And so, yeah, there's going to be public sections of fishable water throughout town that are fairly close. We definitely have a lot of water here that's easy access, easy to fish. Um, the Gunnison also runs into Blue Mesa just little bit west of town here Um, and Blue Mesa is the largest body of water in Colorado Blue Mesa Reservoir and Blue Mesa Dam and from Blue Mesa Dam it goes into the Black Canyon and there's a series of dams throughout there as well um, on the Gunnison but also some great fishing in the Black Canyon most people when they hear the Gunnison they think the Black Canyon Um, but we're like I said we're here right in town we fish just out of town of on of Gunnison Um, and so a lot of times you know we're we're fishing pretty close to town but there are some real scenic sections throughout town here that that we do like to fish so obviously with it being as warm it is in colorado um the gunnison river is starting to you know get free of ice it's getting easier to fish every day and the fish are getting more active every day as 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 well as every you know river around here, the East and the Taylor are starting to warm up every day and get easier to fish and easier access. Um, and for the most part, fishing has been pretty good. Um, we did go out the other day, and it was pretty tough fishing just because it was on the weekend. A lot of people were getting out. And, I mean, where we went, it was just, it was hammered, um, and and people had been fishing a lot. We had a couple groups walk in on us or try to get in on us to fish um, this one hole that we were at, and. We managed to catch a couple, and then, you know, we chalked it up and went and had a beer and called it a day. Um, But when we are fishing right now, we are fishing heavy or deep nymph rigs um, with an indicator. And most of the time in that nymph rig, we have lots of weight, and we either have a worm or an egg on that rig. Just because it's a good attractor, and they do eat it, and um, for the most part, they'll pick up that egg or that worm and then you can throw a midge or something below it. Sometimes I even like to throw a purple prince or something like that just to, um, give them a little bit more of a a variety, but still an attractor. Um, if they aren't eating any of those flies, if if they're not eating, let's say you have a worm and a midge on and they don't want to touch the rig. You can't get them to eat. I usually take that worm off. Same thing with the egg. If you got an egg and a midge on and they're not eating anything, I usually take the egg off first. That means, you know, sometimes the worm and the egg can spook them a little bit and they'll disappear and they won't eat. So change it up a little bit if you are fishing out here in Gunnison. Um, But for the most part, that's a great, you know, little winter rig is a worm and an egg. You can't really beat it. And with the midge combo, um, it's, it's pretty unstoppable. Most people in the winter when they come up to Gunnison and, and want to fish, they go up to the Taylor catch and release, is which I brought up earlier, Taylor CNR. Um, and, you know, depending, I, I will head up there quite a bit during the winter if I'm starting to get antsy and I want to get after it and get some fishing in. I'll head up to Taylor and go fish. Um, but with the Taylor, it's it's an interesting fishery, um, and it's hard to, it's hard to explain, but... It's, it's almost like an aquarium. You sit there and you stare at a lot of large fish all day and you can you try to sight fish for um, for these big rainbows and big browns. And like I said, you only have about a quarter mile. So if it's crowded, it's really crowded. There's, it's bring your own rock fishing, you know. It, it can be tough. But how I like to describe the place, you know, and a lot of people are going to think that, you know, I'm crazy, I'm stupid, I don't know what I'm talking about. But I, you know... I don't think the fish up there are very smart and people are going to correct me. Oh, well, that's, that's 
bullshit. You know, those fish are very smart. They sit, watch them. They don't eat all day. You know, you can throw your rig over them a million times. They won't eat it. I get that. But that's with that involved as well. They're not very smart if they're going to sit there and let me cast at them a million times and slap them in the face with my rig. Thing is, they're selective. Um, and there's a difference between being smart and being selective. Being selective means that they know what they want to eat. They know what they like. So you have to make sure you have that. Um, and yeah, it might take you a hundred casts before you catch the fish that you're looking at. So just keep that in mind when you're up there. It does get very frustrating. It is a tough fishery, especially during the winter. Um, and at times, you know, a lot of those fish are just sitting dormant. Yeah, they're eating, but you know, they're, they're tough to catch. Um, and it can be done and there's a lot of big fish up there, but a good bet up there, you know, is a mycy shrimp. Um, mycy shrimp are in the Taylor reservoir and they get released out of the dam as they come out. And that's why most of these fish are so colored up is because, um, of the chemical in the mycy shrimp. I, I honestly can't remember what it is, but it gets them colored up. And so they're beautiful looking fish, but they do feed on mycy shrimp. They eat a lot of midges, a lot of emergers. And most of the time you're fishing, you know, five, six, seven X in fluorocarbon, um, same, same, same style, you know, heavy nymph rig, a lot of weight for the most part, at least how that's how I fish it. Um, and others will tell you different. There's a lot of different ways you can fish the CNR, but I usually stick to w one certain technique and that's the deep nymph rig. But yeah, mycees, midges, emergers, keep it on there. Keep trying. You'll hook a fish or two. Um, they are fun. It is a good time, especially if you get to see one of those trophy, you know, 25, 26, 27 inch fish. Um, it definitely is a good time fishing up there in the winter. And because it's dam release, never freezes. Um, I have had some brutally cold days up there. Um, obviously not this winter because it's, it's pretty warm out, but you can fish it all year round. And I think the coldest I was up there, it was, it was probably close to negative 30. We were out there fishing and it, it was just blowing snow everywhere and it, it was it was stupid there was no point in being up there but we had to get out and fish and that's what we wanted to do obviously there's going to be some other opportunities throughout the state of colorado um then coming up to the taylor catch and release and freezing your ass off um you know just around here i know that the east is starting to open up and like i said earlier the gunny's definitely opening up um so check out some options look into it a little bit yourself. I'm going to be doing some research as well around the state of Colorado, and we'll be trying to get some guide reports for you guys and, and keep you updated. So that's going to wrap up episode one of the Guided Trip Podcast. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Cameron.Rhodes. I don't have a Twitter. Um, I'm not sure what that is or really how to use it. Um, and before I forget, you can find the company I work for, uh, which is Crested Butte Angler, at www.crestedbutteangler.com, and they are located in Crested Butte, Colorado. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to this first podcast and letting me talk your ears off just for a moment. And uh, I look forward to the next podcast, and I hope you guys do as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.